Okay, then just a quick little check-in to make sure everyone's doing okay with all our technologies and stuff. Uh, is anyone having any trouble with either Canvas or my stat lab? Any questions, issues, problems? No? No? Okay, well, only a few of you joining us, and most of you are waiting for this to appear on YouTube, so... Uh, one last time. Super painfully here. Okay, so to go to Canvas, I'll go through this real quick. You got to go to elcamino.edu. You got to hit right here where it says Canvas. You got to click right here where it says Canvas. You got to go right here where it says Courses. You got to select Math 150. And now there are two sections. I've gotten a couple of emails from people that are confused about this. There are two separate classes that have been merged into one Canvas shell. So some of you are in section 0761. Some of you are in section 0781. You're not in both. Uh, I'm just bringing them together so that I can communicate with everyone in both classes at the same time. Um, likewise, when you open your MyStatLab account, <clears throat> you only have to open it once. Right? You just have to do the homework once, open it once, and more importantly, only you have to pay once. Um, so you don't have to open an account for one of them and an account for the other one, like some people have been emailing me. Okay, So click on there, and that will be our course shell on Canvas. Um, to log on to Zoom, you got to go to Confer Zoom down here, Confer Zoom. And also very important, um, this will only be effective as long as I'm online and I'm on Zoom. So for this class, it's from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday uh, is when we'll be doing our recordings, uh, unless we make arrangements to meet at a certain time. Otherwise, if you just randomly come here at any random time, it won't have the Join Meeting button active. Um, so that apparently there's been some confusion about that, right? Join meeting only means that there's an active meeting happening, it means I'm on Zoom doing something. Okay. Uh, what else is important here? Um, announcements. Go to announcements. <clears throat> and some important things uh, will appear there. Information about our tests. Uh, in this case, there's a calculator. Uh, information about borrowing a calculator from school. Uh, I recommend a TI-84, which is what you can borrow from the school. Uh, but you could really use any calculator that has a you know a statistical package on it um, but I recommend the 84 because that's the one I'm going to be using to demonstrate things so I can show you how to use it uh, if you use your own calculator I don't know how to use your calculator and I'm not gonna learn so you'd have to learn it on your own which is one extra hurdle right so get the 84 I would say you can borrow one from the school for free so you know money shouldn't be an issue uh, as far as getting a calculator, but they might run out. So if you want to borrow one, you should do it sooner rather than later. Okay. Um, when when the the time comes around, our tests will be on here, and I'll come back and show you how to do that once we get to that. But for now, that's all that's really important in Canvas. We're not really using much um, assignments and all that. All that stuff is not really here. Right. All our homework will be on. My stat lab, and you can get to it in different ways. I still like to stick to Course Compass. CourseCompass.com is an old name they used to have. They still own it, so it still takes you to the same place. Their new name is now PearsonMyLabAndMastering.com. So click on there. Uh, if you forgot, if you don't know how, if you haven't opened one, about half of you still have not opened an account yet. So I don't know what's going on, but you better get started on it. I'll just assume that you're not interested and drop you from the class. So create your account now. Uh, watch previous videos on YouTube to walk you through the whole process. Um, oh, another common email I've been getting uh, is when you go to uh, Canvas. Oh, man. Uh, when you go to uh, Canvas, You need to go to your. You got to go to your syllabus to find the the course ID, right? Math one hundred and fifty. 
So I, like I said earlier, you guys are either in section 0761 or in 0781. Figure it out. Go to your myecc.edu account to figure out which section you're actually in. Pick the correct syllabus that you're actually in. And then in the syllabus, you'll find in the body of it a little course ID number. It's my last name with a little special number attached to it. That's what you need to create your, uh, your Pearson account. Okay? So follow those instructions from previous videos on how to register. Uh, to do that, once you've done that, you'll have a username and password. Log in. Remember that when you register, one of the options is to create a free temporary account. It should last two weeks. It'll allow you to create the account and get started on the homework so that you don't fall behind. Uh, you guys should be starting Chapter 5 already. I know a couple of you guys have already finished 5.1 and have moved on, so that's fantastic. Uh, but that's about five of you out of 70. So most of you guys are, well, about, about half of you have opened the account, so at least you've done that. But there's, you know, 30-something of you guys that haven't even opened the account yet, so I'm starting to be concerned a little. Anyway, um, when you open your account, you click on here. You click over here where it says homework, and you can get started on section 5.1. Right, so that's just a quick little uh, overview of the things we need to do. There's, you know, really long, detailed videos uh, in, in my playlist. Uh, that, that, that go into a lot more detail. Okay, so watch those if you have any more questions. All right, that was a quick little infomercial. Make sure uh, people catch up with this. Are there any questions from anybody about any of this? Oh, one question I've gotten that, that's you know, a good valid question from emails um, is about section 150S. Um, 150S does not have a separate MyStatLab account. You only need one MyStatLab account, and that will be where you do your homework for the whole thing, you know, both of them combined. Uh, so you don't have to open two accounts, you don't have to pay for two of them or anything like that, just one. And remember that almost all of the work we do will be on 150. 150S, the support class, will not have very much homework, um, very, very, very little homework, very few quizzes, very easy. The, the intention of the 150S is not to you know, overwhelm you with work. Your attention should be on the 150, right? Um, the 150S, uh, I think I got, a uh, I got into it a little bit before. Um, the reason you have the 150S is because you guys don't qualify to get into the regular 150 class. Um, well, that's why you should be here unless you're accidentally in here, but the reason uh, most of you guys are in here is because you don't have the prerequisite background. You don't have this, the um, intermediate algebra background. So prior to um, this 150S, we would have asked you to go to an algebra class before you can enter into the stats class. This 150S is uh, accommodating you guys, letting you into in, in, into this class even though you don't have the prerequisite. Um, and in exchange, we're giving you extra time in the classroom and uh, you know it's supposed to come with a couple of things to, to kind of support students. That's why it's called the support class so that um, you know hopefully you can be successful in the stats class even though you don't have uh, you haven't satisfied the intermediate algebra. Um, prerequisite. Okay, so that's why it's there. Um, but like I said, for now, don't worry about the homework or the quizzes for Math 150S. It shouldn't be stressful. It shouldn't really be something that, that hurts anybody. Focus on the 150. There's a lot of work. This is the hard part, doing this work here for the 150. Okay, any other questions? Any questions? Any questions? No, 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 no. Okay, I'm gonna get away from all this then. So that'll be the last time I mention anything about um, any of these things. So hopefully you got it. Okay, back to chapter five, section one, where we left off yesterday. Uh, remember that chapter five is on probability. Probability, uh, I think all of us have some intuitive idea of what that means, right? We, we've all run into things in our 
uh, everyday life that involves probability, the odds that something happens, what are the chances that something happens. I think we all have like some intuitive idea of, of what it means, even if we don't have precise mathematical definitions for these things, but that's what we're here to do. So uh, yesterday we left off on this right here. This is a uh, probability model. Remember that a probability model is, um, is a table like this, can be presented as a table like this, where we have an experiment, we think about all the possible outcomes of that experiment, and we write them all down, and then we write down the probability that each one of those outcomes occurs. Right? It's like a little, like a little cheat sheet. Um, I remember when I first started playing poker, for example, um, you know, you, you have to know what beats what, you know, one pair, two pairs, three of a kind, a straight, you know, all these things, and you have to know what beats what. So um, I used to use a little cheat, a little cheat card that had all the possible things that you can have, high card, a pair, two pairs, right? It, it had them all listed on there, every single thing you could possibly have. Um, and then... Um, to kind of help you out, uh, they they kind of gave you some probabilities next to it, so you can have some sense of how hard it was to get any one of those, right? So in any one game, um, following the rules of the game, at the end of the game, what are the odds that the best best hand is one pair, right? That everybody else got uh, single cards and the one person had one pair, and that's the winning hand. You know, it kind of gave you that as a probability. Or following all the rules and exchanging cards and whatever, and it's at the end of the game, and it's time to see who wins, what are the odds that the winner is someone that has a straight? That's the winning hand, a straight. Okay, so it just gave you like a little sense of what those different um, probabilities are, so you can have an idea, uh, and, and that's what a probability table would be, right? a probability model. Good? Okay, so then we revisited this particular example here where we had a bag of peanut M&M's chocolate candies um, and the colors were brown, yellow, red, blue, orange, green. Right? These are the only colors that are in this bag. There is no gold color, there is no black color. Uh, these are the only colors on here. Um, and then next to it they give you a little probability right, associated with that. So if one randomly selected candy is selected from this bag there is a 12% chance that it's a brown one. Okay. If there's one uh, candy selected, the probability that it's red is 12%. Right? There's a 12% chance that one randomly selected candy is red. Right? That's what this table is giving us. Um, in order for it to be a proper probability model, it has to satisfy two conditions. Condition number one is that the sum of the probabilities must add up to one. Right? And one um, can be converted into its uh, percentage representation, right, as 100%. So it has to add up to 100%. Good. And I pointed out why, why that has to be. Well, if it didn't add up to 100%, like if it only added up to 98%, then something is missing, right? 98% of the time, it's one of these colors, but what about that other mysterious 2%? Right? It can't be a different color because we said these are the only colors. So there's something going on there. Right? So it's got to add up to 100%. It can't add up to something below it. And it can't add up to something above it. Right? There is no such thing as uh, over 100% in statistics. In some other areas of math, um, and uh, in, in some other areas of math, it makes sense to have uh, something over 100% but not in this case. Here in statistics and probability, we never go over 100%. Okay? Good. 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 Okay, the other condition for it to be a proper probability model is that each individual probability has to be between uh, 0 and 1 inclusive. No negatives and nothing over 100%. Is there a question? Questions, questions, questions? No, no, no. Okay, then I'll move on. Okay, so um, in statistics, in this class, there's nothing over 100%. Um, there's nothing below zero. And at exactly zero, if, if the probability of an event is zero, 
it means it's impossible, cannot happen. Okay? Um, if an event is uh, certain, it will absolutely happen, then we say that the event uh, has probably one, right? One means it will absolutely happen, right? Very few things are absolute certainties. Uh, so most of the time we do, you know, we'll get close to each one of these, but not necessarily absolute zero or absolute 100%. But there are some things that definitely um, qualify as having either zero or 100%. Right? So, you know, what in life is guaranteed? We will all die. The probability that I will die someday is 100%. Man, it's kind of gloomy. Um, what's a cheerful thing that's guaranteed? You know, the sun will come out tomorrow. 100% chance. Good? Good? And I know some of you are starting to think, well, what if, what if there's, you know, an asteroid or something and it comes and it ends and all that. See, so already you're thinking maybe it's not 100%. Maybe there is some, you know, amazing event that happens and the entire solar system ends today, uh, I guess. I mean, it could, right? So already we're like nitpicking at that 100%. So maybe it's 99.9999999999 out like you know, a hundred million nines, um, but, you know, okay, that's pretty close to 100%. Good, good, good. But like true statisticians would start thinking, man, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable with that 100%. There's always that one tiny, tiny little chance that it could, that, you know, something could go off, right? But anyway, I think we get the, the point. Any questions? Okay. So if something is an unusual event, um, unusually low is, is usually what we refer to when we say an unusual event. Um, so an unusual event is an event that has a low probability of occurring. Um, there's also such a thing as unusually high, right? So when something is really, really, really close to 100%, we might consider that to be unusually high. Um, but most of the time when we say an unusual event, we refer to unusually low. Uh, when we get to uh, normal distributions over down in chapter uh, 7, we'll see that sometimes we care about it being really low to the left-hand side of our distribution or really, really high to the right-hand side of the distribution. Okay, but for now, this is a good enough of the description. Unusual event is something that has a really low chance, and unless it's otherwise stated for you, it usually means that when we say an unusual event, we say that the probability of the event, oops, oh, where am I? Yeah, um, um, probability of the event, E, is unusual if it's less than or equal to 5%. That's usually the, the rule of thumb guideline we go by, unless it tells you otherwise. Any questions about that? Let's, let me finish this sentence here. If, if the probability of event E is less than or equal to 5%, then event E is unusual. Any questions, any questions, any questions? Okay, moving on. There's going to be just a couple of different ways, three different ways, in which we consider probabilities. The first one is called the empirical rule. Okay? The empirical rule, um, the probability of an event E is approximately the number of times event E is observed divided by the number of repetitions of the experiment. Okay? So an empirical uh, probability is achieved by repeating an experiment over and over and over and over and over and observing what happens, keeping note of how often a particular event happens, and so then you divide the frequency, the number of times you see that event occur, divided by the number of trials of the experiment. Okay, so now experiment, I know when, when, when I first, you know, heard the word experiment in statistics, automatically I had these thoughts of scientists in a lab with lab coats, you know, and like little rats running around a maze or something, and that's cool, that's an experiment, but that's not really what we want to think about um, when we think of the word experiment in statistics. 
experiment has a very, very loose um, uh, meaning here in statistics. An experiment could be something as simple as rolling one die and seeing what happens. That's an experiment, right? We roll one single die and we observe what occurs. Uh, or maybe we draw one card from a deck of cards and see what card we got. Okay, that could be an experiment. Or most popular, most frequent, an experiment could simply be that we randomly stop someone on the street and ask them one question. That's our experiment. For example, I might want to know um, how many people mm, how about have seen a particular TV show. We want to gauge how popular that TV show is. Uh, I don't know. What's a what's a good TV show? Recently I saw Succession. I'm gonna plug them in here. It's a fantastic show if you guys haven't seen it. Uh, Succession, it's on HBO. Anyway, what if I wanted to get a sense of how popular this show is? Who's seen it? Um, well, I can just randomly stop people out on the streets and ask them, hey, have you seen that new? Well, I, don't, I guess it's not new. It's already has two seasons. I think they're filming the third season now. Uh, have you seen that uh, TV show, Succession? Yes or no? You know, no, no, I haven't seen it. Okay, then stop the next person. You know, hey, 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 have you seen the new show, Succession? No, I haven't. Right, so I can I can get a sense from that if I if it turns out that you know maybe I stop uh, one thousand people and I ask them, hey, have you seen that show? And maybe it turns out that uh, two hundred and eighteen of them said yes, yes, I've seen that show. Then I give myself a um, a probability. This is the chances, the odds, the ratio that, that can describe for me uh, the probability that someone has seen the, the show. Probability that someone has seen the show. Okay. Now, is it exactly equal to this? Okay, so when we convert it into a decimal, this is going to turn into 0 0.218. Right? Remember that when we divide by uh, multiples of 10, this really fantastic property happens because we live in a number, uh, uh, number, a base 10 number system. Uh, the little decimal that used to be back here gets to be moved to the left by the number of zeros. So that's a cute little trick here. We had 218, and since it's divided by 1,000 with three zeros, that means that this decimal that was out back here, 218, goes one, two, three spaces, and now we have ourselves 0 0.218, right? Or you can just get your calculator and divide them. <clears throat> and next, um, so this is a decimal representation, and if we want to turn it into a percentage, now in the percentage, we go over this way by two spaces, one, two. So now, yeah, it's getting kind of messy here, but I'll say, it's 0 0.218 as a decimal, or it's equal to 21.8%. Okay, so in this little hypothetical, I stopped 1,000 people randomly selected, and I asked them, have you seen this TV show? Let's say that 218 of them said yes, right? Yes, I've seen that show. Well, now I have a sense, an idea, of what is the probability that someone out there has seen the show, 21.8%. So then I can make interpretations about that and say approximately 21% of the population has seen this TV show. Right? It gives me a sense of how popular this TV show, this particular TV show is. Now is that the correct answer? No. Maybe I just happen to um, pick from a crowd that likes the show or has seen the show. Maybe, you know, I, we live here in L.A., maybe, maybe uh, people in L.A. are more likely to watch the show, maybe? Who knows? Um, it's possible that, you know, uh, it, it's possible that TV shows are very popular in some segments of the, of the country and, and not as popular in other segments. Maybe if I go to a different state and I randomly stop people, maybe that number would be a little lower than 218. Good. Or maybe even in this state, it could just be that I, I just happen by chance uh, to pick uh, a bunch of people that happen to have seen this show. Maybe if I go back tomorrow and again repeat the experiment and ask another thousand people, maybe tomorrow when I ask a thousand people, 
maybe only 127 said, yes, I've seen the show, right? Which is very, very different from that one, right? So this isn't the answer. This is just a one good guess at the answer, right? And how good is the guess? Well, remember that by the law of large numbers, the more I repeat this, the more confident I am in my answer, right? The higher this, um, the experiment, the number of times we repeat the experiment, the closer that that ratio will approach the real answer, right? The real answer is out there somewhere, right? The exact percentage of the population that has seen this TV show is somewhere out there. Nobody really knows it, right? Not even HBO people know it uh, because they don't really know exactly who has seen their show and who hasn't seen their show, um, you know? They, they use statistics just like this to try and get a good sense of it, uh, but they don't actually know exactly who has seen it and who hasn't seen it. It's maybe a little easier now that a good portion of people watch the show through their, um, through their website, so maybe they can kind of do a little bit better job of tracking when the show is being watched, but not all people watch it through there. Right? Some people uh, watch it still through their channel, their TV channel thing. Um, some people still have cable, if you can believe it. Um, you know, and some people illegally watch it, right? They illegally download it and watch it somewhere. So you know, HBO would have no sense of that. And also, even when they're tracking that some household is watching it, they have no idea how many people are sitting in front of the TV watching it. Maybe it's just one person watching it. Maybe there's maybe it's like a little watching party. Maybe there's like ten people watching that episode. They don't know, right? So they don't really have a sense of the exact answer of how many people are watching this show. Perhaps nobody really does. All we can do is approximate it, get close to it, have a good level of confidence that we have a good idea of how many people are watching this show. And by the law of large numbers, as we saw yesterday with that little uh, program about flipping coins or about rolling the die, we know that as we repeat the experiment many, 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 many times, um, the, the running proportion of the frequency of the experiment divided by the number of experiments, um, the frequency of the event divided by the number of, ex uh, of experiments, that ratio will approach, we get infinitely close to the true probability of the event. Okay, did that make sense? Any questions about that? Good? Maybe? So just to highlight, I mean, to, to again point out that distinction, you know, if I was lazy, I didn't want to ask a thousand people. I'm just going to ask ten people. Maybe I asked ten people, and out of the ten people, maybe five said, yes, I've seen the show. Well, this is just equal to one half, which equals to 0 0.5, which equals to 50%. So if I only asked ten people, maybe half of them said, yes, I've seen the show. So I would think that I would be under the impression that the probability that someone has seen this show, someone has seen the show, I would think it's 50%. If I did it a thousand times, maybe 218 people said, yes, I've seen the show. Now I'm thinking it's 2108. Which one has more confidence? this one or this one, well, because this one is determined by a thousand people and this one's only determined by ten people, we'd have more confidence that this one's correct, right? Because the element of chance has a bigger impact on a small subset, right? Maybe it just so happens that I picked a, a little group of ten people where um, the number of people that have seen it is, is pretty high. Right? That could happen, but the odds that uh, in a thousand people, chance has a smaller impact. It, it, this is a better representation of what the true nature, uh, the true probability of the event is, right? Because it's larger. And if I want to be even more confident, don't ask a thousand people. Why don't we ask a hundred thousand people? Right? Whatever happens there, now I'm even more confident that it'll be correct. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions? 
maybe, sort of, kind of, maybe, sort of, kind of. Okay, I'm going to move on then. So uh, these are the kinds of uh, homework problems you'll get. So for example, you might be given a table like this. <clears throat> it says, uh, pass the pig, a Milton Bradley game in which pigs are used as dice. Uh, points are earned based on the way the pigs land. Let's look it up. Uh, what is it called? Pass the pig. Good old pass the pig. Pass the pig on game on YouTube. Let's go YouTube. What is this? Pass the pigs, how to play. Each pass the pig game comes with a carry case, pigs, a score pad, and two pencils. The object of the game is to throw the pigs and score as many points in one turn as you can. First player to score 100 points is the winner. Choose a player to go first. On your turn, toss both pigs simultaneously into the air. How did they land? Leaning jowler, cider, mixed combo, razorback, piggyback. Once you have noted the score for your throw, you must decide whether to be a pig head and continue for more points or quit while you're ahead. If you go for more points and pick... Okay, well you get the point. It's these little pig things and you toss them like they were dice and you figure out how they land. Um, and then uh, when you play the, when you, you know, play there's specific positions on how they can land. So they can line with the, the side with no dot. So you saw one of the sides has a dot on it. Side with a dot. <clears throat> and then there's different positions. Razorback, Trowler, Schnauter, Leaning Jowler, right? Um, okay, so uh, points are earned. Uh, there are six possible outcomes. Here they are. One, two, three, four, five, six possible outcomes. So a class of 52 students rolled the pigs 3,939 times. Good. A total of 3,939 times. And they observed what happened. So here's a table showing you those frequencies. Right. Frequency is a word that means how often something happened, right? Okay, so um, of the 3,939 uh, rolls of the two little pigs, 1,344 were cases where it landed with the side with no dot. Okay, I think this is only one pig that's being tossed. One pig is tossed, right? So we're, we're not doing the pair yet. We're just doing one single pig. So we can get a sense of how likely it is, uh, you know, what are the odds that it lands in a particular way. Um, out of the 3,939 times we rolled the pig, 1,294 times it landed with no dot, right? Razorback, whatever that means, you know, some position of the little pig, 767 and so on and so forth, right? So what could we say about the sum of all of these? What do they better add up to? If I add all of these, they better add up to 3,939, right? Because we rolled that one die 1,309, uh, sorry, 3,939 times, and these are the observed values. They better add up to that. Good, good, good. Okay, so now we want to use this information to create a probability model. <clears throat> so it says uh, part A. Use the results of the experiment to build a probability model um, for the way the pig lands. Good. So I think I don't have no. Okay. So to create a probability model, let's just create a little table over here. Um, so outcome, outcome, and then we have side with oops no dot um side with dot and then we have razor back razor back then we have trouter trotter then we have snouter Snouter. And then have leaning jowler. Okay, 
So here are all the possible outcomes when you roll one little pig. These are the positions that it can land in. And now we want probabilities. So um, the probability that it lands with no dot uh, is going to be equal to the division of 1344 divided by 3939. Good. And this is uh, based on the empirical uh, method, right? This is the empirical method. As we repeated the experiment many, many, many times, <clears throat> and we're just observing how often this event happens. The side with dot, that's going to be 1294 divided by 3939. Razorback, uh, that'll be 767 over 3939. Uh, Trouter, that'll be 365 over 3939, and 137 over 3939, and then 32 over 3939. Good. So we can get our calculators out and convert these into decimals and get a, uh, a decimal representation of our probability for each of these. Good. Okay, so let me get my calculator thing. It's a lot of programs running. I hope the computer doesn't start having trouble. Hmm, this thing I hope doesn't expire soon. You have 34 days left. Okay, cool. Okay, so here's my uh, TI-84 calculator. Uh, turn it on if you have one at home, you don't know how to use it, hit, turn it on. Hit clear and then see this little word up here that says quit? You wanna hit second quit to get out of any other screen you might be on. Um, and then you can hit clear again, so it takes you to this screen. Okay. So 13, 44 divided by 39, 39, it's going to be that, and 1294 divided by 39, 39, that's going to be that, and 767 divided by 39, 39, that's going to be that, and 365 divided by 3939 it's going to be that okay let me write some of those down hmm. So this is approximately 0 0.3412. Let's go out to four decimal places, so up to there. Right? And the next one over is a zero, so we, we cut it off at that two. The next one is 0 0.3285, right? four decimal places. And again, the one right next to it is a zero, so we cut it off right there at the five. The next one is 0 0.1947, and then the next one over is a 1, so we cut it off at a 7, right? So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, leave it alone, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, you up one more, okay? So 0 0.092, okay? And then I'm staring at this 6, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 spaces. I look over and it's a six, right? So that means that we up this to a seven. Quick, and I got two more to go. 
137. So 137 divided by 3939 and 32 divided by 3939. Good. So this one's going to be 0 0.3, oops, 0 0.34. 348, right? One, two, three, four spaces, right? So then I peek over and it's an eight, so I gotta up this one by one. And then one, two, three, four, and then if I peek over, it's a two, so we leave it alone. So this one's just gonna be 0 0.0081. Good. Any questions about this? No? Okay, so here's my probability model. Um, and what would happen if I add these things? No, let's make sure that it satisfies our conditions. Number one, each probability is between zero and one, right? There's no negative probabilities. That wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't make sense because, you know, if I'm observing how often uh, the pig lands in certain ways, um, there wouldn't be negative number of times that it lands a certain way, right? It, the, the smallest it could be is zero. It never landed in a certain way. But it can't land a negative three number of ways in a certain position, right? That doesn't make any sense. So no negatives. Negatives make no sense. Um, and in order to get a value that's over one, right, in order to get a number that's bigger than one, it would mean that when I do my fraction, oops, when I do my fraction, that, it would mean that this number would have to be bigger than this number in order to get a, num uh, a number that's bigger than one. For example, if this was, I don't know, 5,432, in this case, the numerator is bigger than the denominator, right? This is called an improper fraction. This is gonna be a case where the answer is definitely bigger than one, right? When it's equal to exactly 39 over 39, this is when it's exactly equal to one. And whenever we have a value between zero and 39.39, we're gonna get a decimal result that's between zero and one. Okay, so is it clear why we can't possibly have one of these answers be bigger than one, right? The only way that would happen is if, let's say, side with no dot, if I observed it and I repeated the experiment 3,939 times and I observed that it happened 5,432, how is it possible that we do the experiment 3,939 times and somehow observe this outcome to occur 5,432 times? That doesn't make sense. The most that could happen is that it's observed the exact number of times we take our experiment, right? So at most, it could be that we have 3939 in one of these outcomes and zero in the rest. Does that make sense? Good. Questions, 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 questions. Okay, so then that first uh, property, that each individual uh, probability, right, each probability must be between zero and one. Right. Each probability individually is between zero and one. That was one property. The second property is that the sum of the probabilities is equal to one. Sum of probabilities equals one. Good. Now, why is that? Okay, let's add these probabilities together. Let's squeeze this over here. So if I find the probability of, let's say, no dot plus the probability of dot plus the probability of razor back. So I'll just put razor, oops. Plus the probability of trouter. Plus the probability of snouter.
plus the probability of leaning jowl. I'll just put leaning. Okay, so here's all those probabilities, right? Okay, so I could put their decimal approximations and say, well, this one is going to be 0 0.3412 plus 0 0.3285 plus this one's going to be 0 0.1947 plus this one's going to be 0 0.0927, sorry, 27. Um, and this one is going to be 0 0.0348, plus this last one is 0 0.0081. Okay, and I could get out my trusty calculator and figure that out, sure. But also remember that this is an approximation of these fractions. So in fact, I could just put the actual fraction, I'm going to do that here. So this is 1344, 1344, divided by 3939, plus the other fraction was 1294, 1294, divided by 3939, plus the other one was 767, divided by 3939, plus the other one is 365 divided by 3939 plus the other one is 137 divided by 3939 plus finally it's 32 divided by 3939 and if I want to add all these fractions luckily they all have a common denominator they all have the same denominator of 3939 so this whole thing can be brought into one big happy fraction as the sum of three nine, uh, 1344 plus 1294 plus 767 plus 365 uh, plus 137 Uh, plus 32 all over 39.39. Good. And what do all these numbers add up to? Well, as we saw before, they better add up to 39.39. Right? That's how we got this up here. We pointed that out over here. just happened oh, this one. Um, right up here we pointed out that the frequency of all of these things better apt to 3939 so the sum of all of these 1344 1294 right all of these better add up to 3939 so this right here better be a 3939 over 3939 and 39, 39 should all equal to 1, right? That's why the sum of the probabilities has to add up to 1. In fraction form, it's a fairly easy thing to prove. In decimal form, it's a little harder to prove why it has to be the case, but um, hopefully you see it now, right? So both conditions of a properly model are satisfied. Each individual probability is between 0 and 1, and the sum of the probabilities has to be equal to 1. Any questions? <clears throat> good, 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 maybe, sort of, kind of, no questions? Okay, so we went ahead and created our probability model, and so now we're able to answer some of these questions. Estimate the probability that a, th uh, a thrown pig lands on side with dot. Side with dot, that's this one. And according to our probability model, it's this. Good. So let's go back to over here. So for part B, uh, estimate the probability of throwing pig lands on side with that. So the probability of side with dot. Side with dot. Remember our notation style, a giant P represents probability, right? That's what this means. 
probability. And then in here we put the event. The probability of event this thing. Right, that's the notation we want to adopt. Equals. Okay, so then um, by our table we saw that side with dot according to our experiment occurred 1,294 times and we repeated the experiment 3,939 times and we saw from over here that when we uh, divided those two things we got a 0 .3285 0.3285 which then converts into a 32.85% Questions, 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 questions. Would that be the final answer, like on a homework assignment for question B, 32.85? Well, you have to pay attention to the instructions. It might say write a decimal between 0 and 1, so this might be the answer, right? It might say write a percentage, so, you know, this might be the answer. Also, it might tell you where to round it. It might say round to two decimal places. Uh, so it might, you know, the answer might be 0 0.33. That might be the answer if it says write it as a decimal round to two decimal places. Or it might say round, uh, write it as a percentage and round to the nearest whole percentage. So the answer might be 33%. You know, so you have to pay attention to the set of little instructions, uh, you know, on the homework to, to type in the correct answer. Or actually, this might also be an answer. It might say, write down a fraction. You know, write down a fraction. Uh, do not reduce and indicate. You know that that best approximates this this answer. Okay. Any other questions? No. 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 Okay. Um, when the test comes around, and you know, when I ask you things. Um, I need to see, you know, something that has a probability statement, right? If I was going to ask you this on a test, um, I need you to write down the, the complete mathematical sentence. So if I asked you this question and you just gave me this fraction with nothing else written, you would not get full credit. You need to write down this giant P, right? Write down the event that we're talking about so that it's clear to anybody that sees this what we're talking about. So it's the probability that we get a side with dot, okay? And then the fraction, you don't have to reduce it or anything. This helps me see where you got it from, right? Where did you get that decimal from? Okay, so you need to show me the fraction. Don't worry about reducing it and canceling things. You know, just write down the, the fraction that describes it with the numbers that are best represented by the exercise. And then use your calculator and turn it into a decimal. I'm happy with either one on, on the test. I don't need you to convert it into a percentage uh, unless you want to. Uh, and then by default, uh, four decimal places is usually what I go by. I might ask for more. I never ever ask for less. So uh, don't ever reduce this to do two decimal places for me on the test. Uh, four at a minimum. If you're not sure, then give me more. Um, I wouldn't penalize you for being more accurate, uh, but I would penalize you for being less accurate, right? So. You know, if I gave this on a test and someone just gave me 0.3 as an answer, right, because they rounded it a lot, they didn't write down a probability statement, I don't know where this comes from, they didn't write down the fractions of where they got it from, they just wrote down 0.3, you know, I can't give them full credit for this, just, just for writing down this. And I know some people might go, well, that's pretty close, it's close enough, you know, you can obviously see, well, you know, um, it's not good enough for me. Okay, so be get yourself used to the full mathematical statement, the probability of, and then the event written down in here, uh, and then a fraction if that's if that's how you get it. You know, different situations will call for different things, but if you're getting your answer by dividing two numbers, write them down. What numbers did you divide, and then four decimal places? Okay, good, good. So just writing 0.3 is not good enough. Okay, the other part said, would it be unusual um, to throw a leaning jowler? Would it be unusual? 
Okay, so let's write that down. Uh, number C here, it said the probability that we had that leaning one, leaning one, leaning jowler. You know, just writing leaning is fine. You know, the other thing we could do, okay, I know let's practice this other method of, of writing things down. You know, statistics, one of the reasons why it's so hard is that it's, it's it, there's a lot of word problems, right? And there's a lot of notation things and a lot of complicated ideas that we have to learn how to express. So the other thing we could do is write down the event, right? So we like to say, how about event, event capital A equals leaning jowler. Leaning jowler. So we define what capital A is. Capital A is that we roll one pig and we get leaning jowler. So that way over here when I'm doing my probabilities, I could say P of A like that, right? So now I don't have to write leaning jowler. So it's a bit of a shortcut and this shortcut is really, really useful when I have to repeat that a lot, right? You'll see in the next coming sections that we're gonna run into uh, probability models where you have to repeat this a lot, like might be probability of A or something else, uh, A and something else. So we have a variety of uh, probability statements that we're going to have to write, and sometimes it makes it a nice shortcut to define an event A, def describe it one time, and then we can refer to A um, within our the body of our work and, and know what it's referring to. Okay, so probability of event A. And we get a lean jowler. Well, we already did that up here again. Uh, we saw that when we repeated it, uh, we repeated the experiment 3,999 times, the result leaning jowler occurred 32 times, right? That's this work right here. I'm just repeating that. 32, it happened 32 out of 3939. And as we saw before, we go to our calculator, and when we go to four decimal places, we got 0081. 81. And if we want to convert that into a percentage, right, two decimal places, that's 0.81 percent right that's less than one percent that's pretty unusual right this is less than one percent chance that's pretty low right and in fact it's lower than five percent for sure and that's the cutoff for unusual so unusual Does that make sense? Any questions, any questions, any questions? Right, by default, unusual means that the probability that that event occurs is less than 5%, right? Unless they otherwise tell you, right? In some cases, unusual might be defined to be even lower, right? We might have a much higher uh, threshold uh, in order for us to consider it unusual, good? Like, for example, I was just watching a video about Europa. Europa, one of the moons uh, around Jupiter. You know, we're very interested in that moon because uh, we think that there is a massive ocean of salt water underneath a crust of ice. And so we're studying it and we're, you know, planning on potentially sending a probe out there and we want to figure out where should it land and we're... Um, looking at data to indicate that there are unusual, unusually interesting things, right? Whatever that may be. Uh, maybe we're looking for a place where the crust, the, the ice crust is thinnest so that we can potentially punch through it and like get to the ocean, right? Because in some places the crust might be really thick, like miles and miles of thick ice. So a probe might not be able to dig through you know, five miles of ice to get to the ocean. But if we can get to a thinner part where the ice is only, you know, a hundred feet deep, a hundred feet, yeah, we can kind of get through a hundred feet. We can't get through five miles deep. So um, we look at uh, data to help us kind of get a sense of where that is. Um, but we want, we, we, we want to be, uh, we want to find a highly, highly, um, unusual spot, right? We, we want it to be um, a, a, uh, 
a spot that's very, very different from the rest in, in terms of having the crust be thinner than anywhere else. So just having, uh, you know, the lowest 5% is might not be good enough, you know, instead of the thicknesses. If we go from wherever it's the thickest to the, the thinnest, the, the bottom 5% of the sites that have the thinnest might not be good enough. We might want to find something that's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly thin for us to be able to have a chance to puncture through it. Does that make sense? Um, maybe that wasn't the great. A, a crucial part for a jet engine, um, and we want to uh, make sure that the part is really safe, so we do st tests on it, right? And they, you know, they come back and they go, well, okay, we did a bunch of tests, and according to the test, there's only a 5% chance that this part will break in half, and therefore the whole engine will catch on fire, and therefore the plane is going to crash. There's only a 5% chance of that. Is that low enough? Probably not, right? You probably wouldn't get on a plane if there was a 5% chance that the engine would blow up. So we want something smaller for a case like that, right? Maybe 1% uh, still wouldn't be good enough. That'd still be too high, right? We'd want a point zero 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 right? Very, 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 very small chance that it would break, right? There's always a chance. There isn't zero. Um, so there's always going to be some level of, of, of uh, danger that when you get on a plane, a crucial part might break and the plane would crash, right? But, but we um, insist on having incredibly small chances for that, thereby making flying uh, very, very safe. Right? Safer than driving a car, safer than any other mode of major tran uh, uh, you know, transportation. Good? Questions, 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 questions? Okay, uh, let's see what the author wrote. Okay, so these are the same things I did, but notice that here the author wrote it uh, approximated to three decimal places instead of me that I approximated it to four. Same thing. So here is the table. And yeah, same same answer I got. 32.9008, very, very... Okay, all right, moving on. So all of this has been through the empirical way of uh, finding probabilities, right? The other method that we're going to study is called the classical method. So the classical method um, of com the classical method for computing probabilities uh, involves experiments that have equally likely outcomes. That's incredibly important for us to be able to uh, implement this method. Okay, so you have a situation where you can one list out all the possible outcomes, and two, all the outcomes are equally likely of occurring. A classic example of this is rolling a six-sided die. We know exactly how many sides are there. There's six of them. It's a six-sided die. Um, and each side is equally likely of occurring, assuming that it's a fair dice, right? Okay, so in, in a situation like that, we, we have ourselves an opportunity to do classical, uh, the classical method. Um, in a place where we don't have that is where either we don't have a way of knowing all possible outcomes. So, for example, if my experiment is that I'm just going to stop someone on the street and ask them, um, you know, name your favorite, uh, you know, name your favorite, I don't know, TikTok star. Who's your favorite TikTok star? I don't know. There's so many answers. It's not possible to even list down all possible outcomes, right? Like you can't, before you ask the person, before you stop them and ask them, you can't possibly create a list of all possible answers, right? It's just, there's just so many, right? So in a, in a, in a, um, in a case like that, uh, we wouldn't really be able to apply the classical method because we can't even write down the possible answers, right? Okay, now there are some cases where you can list the possible answers, and it might be very few possible answers, um, but the they are not equally likely of occurring. Okay, um, so um, for example, if I stopped somebody, if I stopped an American 
um, any American um, uh, was asked a survey question, what state do you live in? Okay. Um, we know how many possible outcomes there are, and maybe they don't live in America, right, at the moment. Maybe they're Americans, but they're not living in America. So maybe one of the options is not in the country at the moment. So if that's the case, then we only have uh, 50 states, uh, so it could be one of those, or not in one of the states, right? Because I guess they could also be living in uh, Washington, D.C., which is not, not well, it's technically in Maryland, but okay, it's not really a state. Um, or they could be living in Puerto Rico, and that means they are Americans, they are American citizens, but they're not living in one of the 50 states. So anyway, so there's 51 possible options. 50 states, and then not in one of the states. Um, but are they all equally likely of occurring? If I randomly stopped uh, or randomly surveyed an American and asked them what state do you live in, um, there are 51 possible outcomes, but they're not all equally likely of occurring because some states are more populated than others, right? Um, I believe California is the state with the highest uh, population of Americans living in them, and the state with the lowest, I don't know for sure, I would guess it might be Alaska, um, that would be my guess, or maybe like Maine's probably pretty low, Montana's pretty low, um, you know, it's one of those, uh, at any rate, but they're not equally likely of occurring, right, because some states have a lot more people in them than others, so even though I can list out the outcomes, they're not equally likely of occurring. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay. So when we have an experiment that we can list out all the outcomes and all the outcomes are equally likely of occurring, then we can apply the classical method. In the classical method, we list out our sample space with all possible outcomes. We identify the event of interest, whatever that may be, and then we can count our way to getting our probability. Count the number of ways that event E occurs, count the number of possible outcomes there are in our sample space, divide those two, and that will be your probability. We call that probability the theoretical probability, the, the, it's the exact probability of the event. When we did the empirical rule, remember the empirical rule was never actually the answer, it just approximates the answer, and the more we repeat the experiment, the more confident we are that that approximation is going to get infinitely close to the real answer. Whereas this method, if it can be applied, gives you the exact answer. Good. Good, good, good. Notation-wise, remember we keep using this giant P to represent probability, right? Probability event E is equal to the number of ways event E occurs divided by the number of possible outcomes. We usually rep use uh, N, well, capital N really, uh, to represent the number of possible outcomes in our sample space. Um, and here we're using M to represent the number of ways that E occurs. We also are going to introduce this giant N notation. This giant N notation means the number of, out, uh, of elements in this event, right? The number of ways that this event occurs. And then remember, S represents the sample space, so this represents the number of uh, values or events in our sample space whereas this represents the number of events in our event, capital E, right? Number of outcomes in event, uh, event E. Does that make sense so far? Kind of, maybe, kind of, maybe. So let's just do a super, super simple uh, result here with coins. So let's say my experiment, experiment is just a super simple flip a fair coin. Flip a fair coin. Oops, coin. Right, so there's just two sides. It's either going to be tails or it's going to be heads. Right, so if I'm going to flip it, um, uh, so let's say I flip it two times. Flip a fair coin two times. Okay, let's write down. Um, uh, let's write down all possible outcomes. So our sample space S. Now, hmm, let's let's be more specific about this. Uh, let's flip the fair coin two times. Okay, that's fine. 
So uh, we're going to do it one at a time. So think about flipping it one at a time. So I have my first flip. So maybe my first flip uh, could be, you know what, let's, let's do a tree diagram to find out all the possible outcomes. So there's the first time I flip it, I can get a tails or I can get a heads. And then the second time I flip it, the second time could be a tails or the second time could be a heads. And then over here, the first time could be a heads, the second time could be a tails. Or over here, the first time is a heads, the second time uh, it's, is a heads. So this leads me to the possible outcomes. I could have T, T. First time was tails, the second time was tails. I can have a T, H. The first time is a tails, the second time was a heads. Or I could have a heads, tails. Or I can have a heads, heads. Right, so my experiment was to flip two coins. I'll put one at a time. One at a time. Good. Okay, and remember, notation is really big in statistics. Uh, it's, it's a real big hurdle. So hopefully it's clear what I mean by this, right? TH means that the first coin was a tails, second coin was a, uh, was a heads. Right, so here the order matters because we're talking about the first coin versus the second coin. So now when I write down my sample space, I can write down TT, comma, uh, TH, comma, HT, comma, HH. Good? Questions, 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 questions? Okay, so now let's say that my event, let's say I wanted to come up with an event, let define event, event, um, I don't know, W, equals uh, at least, at least one tail uh, comes up. At least one tail. You see at least one tail. Yeah. Ah, one, at least one tail occurs. Occurs. Okay. So now, which one of these simple events, right? These are the simple events in our sample space. In fact, another thing we could have done, let's just put this over here, we could have said, let's define E sub 1 as a simple event. Um, oops, E sub 1 be this guy. I could have defined this as simple event sub 1, simple event sub 2, simple event sub 3, simple event sub 4. Right? So another way that I could have described my sample space, S, is to say that it's E sub 1, E sub 2, E sub 3, E sub 4. Okay, so now, of these events in my sample space, when I flip two coins, how many of those events satisfy this statement that at least one tail occurs? This event has at least one tail. In fact, they're both tails. This event has at least one tail, right, right there. This event has at least one tail, right there. And then this event has no tails. So in this event, um, event E, I'm sorry, event W is satisfied by E1, E2, and E3. So that I could say that the probability of event W, right, at least one tail occurs, is equal to three out of four. It's um, three out of four. Let me uh, actually write down the other thing. Is equal to the number of ways that W can happen divided by the number of values in our sample space. The number of ways that event W can occur is three of them. There's three ways that can happen. Three divided by four, which we can turn into 0 0.75 or 75%. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? No? No? No, 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 no. 
What if I had a different event and that event was the second coin was a tails? Let event um, Q mean uh, the second coin. Second coin was a tails. Right? So now I want to specifically say the second coin flipped. So if I look at my sample space, how many of them satisfy the statement that the second coin was a tails? That's this one and this one. Yeah, those two. Those are the only two cases where the second coin was a tails. Good. Okay, so now I could say that event Q is satisfied by E sub 1 and E sub 3. by E sub 1 and E sub 3. Good. Um, and I can stick to this style of notation or I can also just write it down by T, T, comma, H, T. Those are the two cases where the second coin is a tails. Good. So now if I want to find that probability, probability of event Q, that's equal to the number of ways event Q can happen divided by the number of way, uh, values in my sample space and there are two ways that event Q can happen so that would be 2 out of 4 making it 0 0.50 or 50 percent there's a 50 percent chance that the second coin is a tails any questions about this Maybe, kind of. <laughs> For classical method solving, like, um, we would have to do the the tree diagram to like find out all the possible mm -hmm. outcomes. Sometimes, um, you have to do something to figure out all the possible outcomes. Um, a tree diagram is is one way of doing it. It works pretty good as long as it's a relatively simple example. Uh, once they get more complicated, there's some other kinds of things you could do to kind of kind of establish a pattern that shows you all the possible outcomes. But um, it's very easy to think of a situation where the possible number of outcomes is massive, super super massive, and so the problem, the, you know, the difficulty of the exercise might be in just figuring out how many outcomes are there. Um, and there's a whole branch of math where a big part of what they do is think about how many ways can this happen, right? We call that branch of math combinatorics. So, you know, it could be, you know, it's very easy to, uh, to, to come up with an example that's super, super difficult, super complicated, um, and you know it's, it's hard to even count them so if we're lucky a tree diagram will give it to us um, if we're not lucky then it becomes even harder to figure it out but one way or another we need to come up with all the possible outcomes and sometimes it's just the brute force method right you just have to really think hard and come up with all the possible outcomes uh, that can occur you know and that's that's pretty challenging um, so that's it's just one of the ways in which we have to do it. Uh, now, as far as the homework goes, you know, just pay attention to what the instructions are, um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, you can figure it out. Any other questions about this example? <clears throat> so it's really impo important to, to to highlight that in this case, it was a fair coin, and um, therefore every one of these outcomes is equally likely of occurring. When I flip two coins, there's an equal chance that I get two tails. There's an equal chance that I get two heads. Right? All of these are equally likely of occurring. The probability of any one of these things is equal to one out of four. 
right? Let me put those over here. The probability that we get TT is equal to one out of four. The probability that we get TH in this order, right here we're saying the order matters, first the tail, then the heads, is equal to one out of four. The probability that we get the other way around, HT, still one out of four. The probability that we get heads, heads, is one out of four. They're all equally likely of occurring. Good. Good, good, good. Now on the other hand, this thing gets confusing sometimes. We could think about this. Someone could ask us, find the probability that we flip two coins, right? Flip two coins and we get exactly, exactly one head and one tail. Do you see how this statement is different than these? These are specifying a specific order. First came the tails. Now this is coin one. This is coin number one. And this is coin number two. Coin number two, right? And same thing over here. This one is coin number one and this one is coin number two. So this notation over here is including a particular order. Whereas over here, this statement doesn't say anything about the order. Two coins are flipped, one of them is heads, one of them is tails. What's the probability that that happens, right? So here, no order is um, being required, right? So here we have order, right? In all of these cases, this is with order, right? Order matters. Whereas here, no order. I don't care, one heads, one tails, give it to me in any way you can. Okay, well, when we count the possible number of outcomes, one heads, one tails, these two satisfy this statement. Good? So, this is gonna be equal to two out of four. There are two ways to satisfy this. This way and this way, right? This way and this way. Out of four. So the probability of this one is going to be 50%. One out of two, which is 50%. Does that make sense? So the probability of just getting a tails, then a heads, is equal to one fourth, which is equal to 0 0.25 or 25%, but the probability of getting one heads, one tails, one head, one tail, in any, any order, is equal to two out of four, which is equal to 0 0.50, which is 50%. Is that a question? Questions, 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 questions? I actually have a question. Yeah. Uh, why didn't the whole fraction actually double because there's another coin? Like why the, the, didn't the, the whole unit? fraction double? Where are you pointing? Where are you thinking about? Uh, for like the, the bottom section because there's so, two different outcomes. So the fact that we have four here, this four, comes from the fact that when I thought about my, my samples, my sample space, there are a total number of four possible outcomes. That's why there's a four there. So it's not, it's not connected to the number of coins, right? There's not four coins, um, but it's connected to the number of possible outcomes. Now there happens to be a nice little pattern that exists in this situation uh, because it's multiples of two. Um, but you really shouldn't tie that down to that. This is, this is just for this particular example. As we move on to another example, as you'll see in a second, um, it might not have anything to do with the number of things you're playing with in your experiment, coins or dice or whatever. It just simply goes back to your sample space and counting how many possible outcomes are there total. Right? And that's where that four came from. So if I threw in another coin out here, this would go in multiples of two. So if I had three coins instead, we'll see that there's eight outcomes, and so it would be out of eight. 
Did that answer your question? Yeah, that makes sense. Good, good, good. Okay, any other questions on this before I move on to the next experiment? I mean, uh, example over here. No? We're good, we're good. Okay, so now let's go back to our classic M&M situation. Suppose a fun-sized bag of M&Ms contains nine brown candies, six yellow candies, seven red candies, four orange candies, two blue candies, and two green candies. Suppose that a candy is randomly selected. What is the probability that is yellow? Okay, so let me tell you the wrong way to do this first. All right, I'm going to put it in red since it's wrong. No. Well, I shouldn't put no, I should put wrong. Anyway, okay, so I'll, I'll cross it out in a second. Okay, so here is the most popular wrong answer. Probability that it's yellow. People think, well, it could either be brown or yellow or red or orange or blue or green. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six possible answers, so they think that the probability that it's yellow is one out of six, right? Which turns into 0 0.1667, right? And that's wrong, right? What's wrong with it? There are six colors, but the colors are not equally likely of occurring, right? There's a lot more brown in there. If I, if I had a bag, if you can imagine me having like a little bag and you can't see through the bag and I put in there nine brown ones and six yellow and seven red and four orange and two blues and two greens and shake it all up, shake it all up in there and you reach in there and you grab one candy, it's more likely that you get a brown one, right? Because there's a lot more brown in there. It's less likely that you get a blue one or a green one. Is that? Questions? Guys, don't forget to mute your mic if you don't have a question. Okay, so it's wrong that we do it this way because they're not equally likely of occurring. If this example had said that we had the exact same number from each color, right? If I said there were uh, 10 brown ones, oops, 10 brown, 10 yellow, 10 green, uh, 10 red, uh, 10, what am I missing? Brown, yellow, green, yellow, orange, 10 orange, uh, that color blue, 10 blue, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, in this case, they all have the same number of candies. So now in this case, the probability that we get a yellow is equal to 1 out of 6. So if this was the, the description, then this would be okay. But that's not the description. They gave me a lot more brown. Right, we could really, really highlight this by really overemphasizing what if there was 100 brown ones and there was only uh, one yellow and there was only one green and there was only one red and there was only one orange and there was only, I don't know, how about 13 blue. Okay, so if I mixed them up like this and threw them into a bag and shook it all up, clearly the most likely result of randomly picking one of the M&Ms is that it would be brown. because There's just a lot more brown in there. It would be very difficult to get one of these guys, right? So intuitively we'd know that the probability of getting a green or a red or an orange or yellow would be really, really small. And blue was a little bit more likely, but it's still much more likely that you get a brown one, right? So we have to take into consideration these numbers. We can't just ignore them. We can't just count the colors. Unless all the colors were the same. Good. Okay, so back to this example. So this is the wrong way to approach this one because their numbers are different. But if we take the numbers into consideration, let's go back to the right way of doing this. So let's see, we had brown. We had um, yellow. We have red, we have orange, we have blue and green. 
um, green. And there were nine brown ones. There was six yellow ones. There are seven red. There are four orange. There are two blue ones. And there are two green ones. Okay, the first thing we have to do is add all of these up to figure out what the total number of candies are in there. So that would be 15, 22, 26, 30, right? They add up to 30. Good. Okay, so now the probability that we get a yellow one is equal to the number of ways to get a yellow one divided by the number of values in our sample space. And so this would be equal to 6 out of 30, which reduces to 1 fifth, which equals to 20%, 0 0.20, or 20%. Any questions, any questions, any questions? Another useful way to visualize this is to visualize all 30 uh, candies, right? So there are, let's see if I can get brown, brown. There are nine ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine brown ones. And then there are uh, yellow. There are one, two, three, four, five, six yellow. Then we have seven red, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven red ones. And there are four orange, orange, oh, orange looks a lot like yellow, huh? One, two, three, four orange. Then we got two blue ones, one, two blue ones, and two green ones. Okay, so here are all the M&Ms. And if I take all of these and put it in one giant bag and shake it all up, right, and visualize that, and then we're going to take one out of the this bag. Okay, so how many uh, of this bag, how many are yellow? Okay, well, here there are. There's six of them. The number of ways to get a yellow one is these guys. There's six of them. And the number of values in our sample space, well, there are 30 in, in all. Right? That's where we get these things. Any questions? Kind of, maybe, sort of, kind of, maybe. Okay, so moving on then. Let's see what the author wrote for that same thing. Okay, so there's a total of 30 candies. Probability that it's yellow is equal to the number of yellows divided by the number of our sample space, which is going to be 6 out of 30, which gives you the 1 fifth or 0.2 or 20%. Now, if we wanted to find the number of blue, that would be 2 out of 30, right? There was two blue ones, the number of blue over the number of our sample space, which gives you to 0 0.067. Good. Um, what was part C? How come it's asking... Part C, comment on the likelihood of one candy being yellow versus blue. Okay, comment on the likelihood. So if the probability of being yellow is 20% and the probability of being blue is 2 out of 30, which is equal to 0 0.067, which translates into, this translates into 20% chance that we get a yellow one. And this translates into a 6.7% chance that we get a blue one. So obviously getting a blue one is a lot less likely than getting a yellow one, right? It's almost a multiple of three, right? If we multiply, uh, well, no, it's exactly a multiple of three. So this times three equals to this one, right? Three times two over 30 is actually equal to six over 30, right? So if we multiply the probability of getting a blue one probably getting a blue times three is equal to the probability of getting a yellow. So yellow is three times more likely than blue, and it's already three times bigger. So it's three times more likely than a blue. 
Any questions? Questions, 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 questions. Okay, uh, we already did this yesterday with our simulation of dice. Remember, we roll the die and we keep track of how often something occurs. So let's do it by the classical method now. So if we roll one six-sided die, experiment, roll one six-sided die. Six-sided die. Okay, and then um, we can write down our sample space. Sample space. Well, that's easy. It's we get the number one, or we get a two, or we get a three, or we get a four, or we get a five or we get a six. Okay. Okay. Well, we could just write down one, two, three, four, five, or six as our possible outcomes. Good. So now the probability that the die equals four is equal to the number of ways in which the die could equal four divided by the number of values in our sample space. Good. Well, clearly there's only one way that the die could equal 4. It's this one, right? It's this one. It's only one way that the die could equal to 4. So we write a 1 here. The number of ways that this could be satisfied is only one way. And how many are there in our sample space? There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 of them. So we divide it by 6. When we divert, uh, use our calculator, we can convert this into a decimal. It would be equal zero to 0 0.1667, which is approximately equal to 16.67%. Good. So this is the uh, theoretical probability. This is the exact probability that we uh, get a 4 when we roll a 6-sided die. We saw in um, the simulation from before that as the computer simulated rolling a die once, rolling a die twice, rolling a die three times, you know, it kept doing it over and over and over again and keeping track of how often we actually got that result from our die and then keeping track of the running proportion of how often we got it. Uh, we saw yesterday that eventually as we did this a simulation thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times, eventually the result approximated this good questions 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 no 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 okay the last thing we're going to look at is something we call subjective probability subjective probability is um when we find the probability when we approximate the probability of something that doesn't necessarily fit either of the two results uh, subjective probability just means that it's the opinion of an expert. An expert is looking at the situation and in their best opinion they tell you what the odds are. Okay, So for example, um, if we want to figure out what is the probability that the Los Angeles Rams will win the Super Bowl next year um, in, in, well, you know, Super Bowl 2021, that's kind of a, alright, whatever. Super Bowl 2021, assuming we have one, thanks COVID. Um, assuming we have a Super Bowl this this coming year, what are the odds that um, the Los Angeles Rams win it? Right? How can we find that probability? It is not a classical situation. Does that make sense? If we think about all the teams, right? How many NFL teams are there? I want to say 32. Does anybody know? I'm not gonna look it up. Whatever. Let's just say there's 32. If there's 32 teams, Rams is one of them, do you think that the chances that the Rams win the Super Bowl, Rams win, is equal to 1 out of 32? What's wrong with that thinking? Right? This would be under the assumption that all teams are equally likely of winning. Right? If this was just some sort of a random luck thing, right? that all teams have the same chance of winning, then 
the answer would be one out of 32, but that's not really the case, right? That's not true that all teams are equally likely of winning, right? There's big things happen there, right? Obviously players, injuries, coaches, you know, bribing money, like all kinds of stuff goes into deciding who wins the game and who doesn't win a game, right? So that's definitely not the way to do it. So the classical way is out, right? We can't do it by the classical way. Can we do it by the empirical way? All right, now the empirical way would mean that we repeat the experiment over and over and over again, right? So we'd have to kind of repeat it over and over and over again, simulate it over and over again. Well, we can't do that because we can only have one game, right? We can't have the game be played, you know, the season be played. It's not even just the game, right? We have to like play out the entire season to see who even makes it into the Super Bowl and then decide uh, if the Rams win it. So we can't simulate the whole season over and over and over and over again. That's not, that's physically impossible to do that, right? Um, and we can't even have a computer do a good job of that because there's just so many variables that are unknown, right? Um, weather is a big thing, right? What if an important game, it, during an important game, a massive storm hits and that impacts the 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 game the outcome of the game injuries right or players could be caught doing something you know that they shouldn't be doing and they are you know thrown out of the game right all kinds of things could happen that impact the game so we can't simulate it in a computer program very accurately right so the classical ways out the empirical ways out we can't do that so the only thing we could do for a situation like this is use subjective probability. That just means we rely on an expert, someone that really knows the the game, the players, you know, has inside information of all the back dealings and who's going to get traded, who's not going to get traded, who's injured, who's not injured, which player is, you know, fighting with their coach and therefore doesn't want to play and, you know, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, even, like, personal behavior, right? Maybe some player has a drug problem and they know that that's getting out of control or some other player is going through a divorce and so they're not focusing on the game like all these tiny little things just could impact the game and so the only reasonable way we can guess the prediction right guess the odds that the rams win is to rely on an expert expert will tell us what they think and that's as good as we can get right Obviously, different experts have different opinions, so it's not like we can get the answer. There's no such thing as the answer. We can just guesstimate how close we are, right? Uh, approximate it, but an expert has a better chance of uh, giving you a good guess than someone that doesn't really pay that much atten attention to the game. Does that make sense? Questions, 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 questions? Um, another example of this could be um, uh, boxing. I heard that Mike Tyson wants to get into the boxing thing again. Um, I think he's like in his 50s, right, at this point. Uh, so, you know, he's not going to be as as uh, great as he was, you know, in the prime of his physical um, status. But um, I'm, sure, I'm sure he can still throw a punch, right? So... What if I decided to fight him? I don't know. They 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 uh, decided to throw an amateur in there with Tyson. It's going to be it'd be good television, right? You guys would probably tune in to watch Tyson beat me up. Um, you know, can I possibly win? Right. The classical approach would be to think about possible outcomes. Um. Right. So. Uh, so there's me versus Mike Tyson, right? So who's going to win? Well, the classical approach would say there's only two outcomes, right? Me or him, two outcomes. So the probability that I win is equal to one out of two. There's a 50% chance, right? That's the classical approach. And that's obviously wrong, right? There's no way that I have a 50% chance of beating Mike Tyson. Um, 
So what's wrong with this thinking? There are two possible outcomes, either he wins or I win, but they are not equally likely, right? So that's what's wrong with this, right? Two possible outcomes, two possible outcomes, but they are not equally likely. Good? So we can't approach it this way. Either he wins or I win, 50% chance. No, this doesn't work that way. Good? Okay, well, we can approach it by the empirical method. By the empirical method, we would have to repeat this over and over and over and over again. Either physically actually do it or have like a computer program simulator or something like that. But can a computer program actually genuinely simulate the, you know, what's going to happen in each individual round? Not really, you know, who knows? Maybe Mike Tyson decides to play with me and just kind of jabs at me for a while and keeps me up so that it can, you know, keep the fight going for a little while and make it interesting. Maybe he decides to really beat the hell out of me as soon as the bell rings to like prove a point or something. I don't know. Maybe he's mad that day and wants to take it out on me. I don't know. Uh, who knows? Maybe as he's running toward me about to kill me, he trips on his shoelace, hits the floor and gets knocked out. Maybe I get lucky and win that way. You know, who knows? Um, so there's just so many things that, that, that can happen that a computer program can't possibly simulate it. And we can't um, physically repeat the experiment over and over because that means I'd have to fight them thousands of times. Let's, let's set up the fight 10,000 times and see of those 10,000 times how often he beats me up. Uh, that, that would be devastating to me. Right? So we can't do that. So the empirical method's out. Does that make sense? So the only thing we can go by is an expert. Expert knows, um, you know, what are the odds, and obviously, highly, highly, highly likely he wins. The game, I mean, the fight might not even be whether he wins or not. It, it might just be like a contest, you know, uh, uh, to see if you're still, you know, up and walking. Does he knock you out, or are you still able to walk around in three rounds? Right? Who would who would do that? Would make great TV, right? Three rounds with Mike Tyson. Can you survive? Win a million dollars if you can do that. You know, how many of you guys would fight Mike Tyson for three rounds, and if you're still able to stand up and walk after three rounds, you get a million bucks. If he knocks you out and you're knocked out in three rounds, you don't win three million. You don't win a million money. I think that would make great TV. If any uh, if any uh, TV producers are out there? Let me know. We'll set this up. No? 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 All right. Anyway, um, any questions about the three methods? We've got classical, we got empirical, and we got subjective. No? 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 no. Um, here's another example the book had. Similar to the stuff I've been talking about, um, in, in his fall 1998 article in Chance Magazine, Hell Stern investigated the probability that a particular horse will win a race. He reported that those probabilities are based on an amount of money bet on each horse. When a probability is given that a particular horse will win in a race, is this empirical, classical, or subjective? Okay, so it's, it's subjective, of course, because it's based on somebody's intuition, somebody's feelings. Um, and so we, we rely on, on an expert to give us their best opinion, right? And of course they could be wrong, but it's the best we can do. Any questions at all? No? No? So we got three different kinds of probabilities. Uh, let's take a little break. Let me see one second. Oh, wow. Not a break. We're almost done. It's almost nine. Okay. Um, so this would be a good place to stop then. Okay. This is taking a while. Good. This is just a lot to cover. This is, this is thick stuff, right? Material is dense and it takes a long time.
to get through the definitions and the examples. So I finally finished section five, I mean chapter five, section one. We'll, we'll come back and uh, continue on this Monday uh, with section 5.2. Uh, but for now, all of you guys should be able to do at least 5.1 on, uh, on your account, okay? So make sure you log on to Canvas at least once so that I know that you are active and that you are, you have, you, you intend on completing the course, right? Otherwise, I might get concerned that someone out there hasn't logged in and maybe doesn't know the semester has started or doesn't know they're enrolled in this class or something. So uh, please at least once log into Canvas. It'll clock in that you've logged in and I know you're active. Also, create your MyStat Lab account. Remember that you have a two-week free trial, so there should be no excuses for, for not opening one. Um, and you should be able to do the homework from Chapter 5, Section 1. If you finish that, um, you can move forward. Don't wait for me. Uh, you can read the book, section, section two, right? chapter five, section two, read the book and get started on the homework. You know, Even if you don't quite get every little thing and you don't finish the homework, that's fine. Uh, you can wait until next week when I continue to explain some of these ideas and maybe at that point, you know, you'll be ready to finish up the homework. But I'm sure there's a few things that you can do uh, in these sections, right? There's a lot of homework, so uh, whenever you have some free time, it's good to chip away at it. Okay? Any questions at all before we sign off? No? 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 All right, that's a good place to stop then, and I will see you next uh, Monday. <laughs> have a good weekend. Full of math, I hope. Stay safe, and uh, see you Monday.